Hey, this is Dennis, and welcome to another episode of the Grounded Reason Podcast, where Joel and I usually discuss things like uh, cord cutting and issues surrounding the internet. But today, we're going to kind of deviate from that. And we used to do this quite often, um, I would say, early on when we first started the podcast. Yeah. Um, where we kind of take a topic that has to do with technology or some somehow grounded in technology and kind of explore it. In the past, we've done, you know, Bitcoin and, uh, well, more blockchain. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about, I mean, we've talked about net neutrality ad nauseum. AI. Uh, yeah, and we've covered AI. Today, yeah. I mean, it's going to be a little bit of the AI stuff, but uh, I think more in the in the vein of automation and how technology kind of has an impact um, when it comes to, you know, the labor force. Yeah. And, and I mean, I'm sorry, you were going to say something? God. I was just going to start out with some some initial thoughts. Like, anytime there's a big shift in technology, right? Like, uh, the maybe the last comparable one, at least this is one of the ones that's being used in analogies, is like the industrial age, right? right? Like when the steam engine really started to take off. Yes. Um, a lot of the jobs that existed prior to that will just go poof, right? They will, uh, and, and it's not immediate, but it's pretty fast, right? Like it's it's societal changing, right? Or society changing. Yeah, and especially with like the industrial revolution, it was like, such a cultural shift too at the time that I don't know if you we, when you hear when you hear people talk about automation they really just talk about people losing jobs but they don't really talk about how it kind of completely changes culture and the way you I know. do think there's going to be some big ones but I don't think it's as big as the transportation revolution yeah right? well I mean when I'm when I, I guess I guess kind of like for an example of what I'm saying is back then um, before the industrial age uh, everything was you know, is majority agricultural. You yeah. have people with farms. And if you were a farmer and you own a land, you were, you know, you're pretty much, you know, sitting on, you know, you're upper 10%. Yeah. Um, your children would, you know, learn how to work the farm. Yeah, um, that's where the future was. Right. So when the Industrial Revolution kind of took place, uh, instead of, you know, working the plot of land, you know, the kid turns seven or eight and it's time for them to go to the factory with dear old dad and learn how to, you know, do, cause that's what yeah. we, cause I mean, and I understand that because that's what they did. It was, yeah. you know, I'm going to raise my kid to teach him how to do the work that yeah, I it do. It was a very apprenticeship type model. Right. And well, and then, you know, you kind of know what happened from there where you're talking about, you have factories full of children, you know, yeah. work and horrible, awful well, conditions. So society then had to figure out laws around those and right. regulations. Right. So, and, and I guess that's kind of like the example that I'm saying that like, there's probably going to be kind of unforeseen changes mm -hmm. like that, that we can't even really fathom at this no, point. No, I think you're absolutely right. All right. So, Let's start with um, describing what the general technology set we're talking about is. Yeah, and and really, I mean, it's been happening for a while. I yeah. mean, we we're talking about robotics in factories. Yeah. And to the point where, I mean, I pulled up some statistics kind of on this today. I went to um, the Federal Reserve's economic data. Yep. Fred, for short. Um and I started to look, and I went back to, you know, 1987. I went to from the first quarter of 1987 um, to now, and I looked at, you know, the manufacturer. I figure if you, I mean, especially if you look at the last election, a lot of it was over manufacturing jobs. There are a yeah. lot of people, there's a lot of people who have been, you know, manufacturing is kind of like the economic, was the economic engine of America um, when yeah. it came to labor. And it's kind of ceased to be that. But was, the in interesting fact that I found out is it still makes up half of our economy on output. Yeah. So so this is a little known uh, secret within our economic data. That's exactly right. That our uh, output from manufacturing uh, is in terms of percentage of GDP – has still been marching along. Right, it's like six point five trillion, which is yeah, a little less than half. It's huge, right? right. And uh, I think it's actually closer to like forty percent, but whatever. Right. The, the point is, it's huge, and um, 
what has happened, though, is that through automation, and and this is why I think it will be useful to talk about like what automation is, right? Because it seems very obvious. But uh, through automation, the number of people you needed to reach higher and higher levels of output went down. Right. Right. So you didn't need people to put all of the screws in uh, the side of a car, right, and do all the welding. Once you had a robot that could do that reliably. Right. right? Or you got the one person, because at that point you're going to have somebody who, you know, you're controlling instrumentation at that point yeah. you're you're not sitting there you know riveting a car together yeah. you're actually you know monitoring controls and ensuring that the robots are doing their job and everything okay. is running you know as it like it's supposed to and and it's um, it's good you brought that up because that's exactly what like i found some really good data on this um in the manufacturing uh sector in the first quarter of 87 to now or first quarter of 2017 um the number the, the the manufacturing output has gone up eighty five percent. Yeah, so almost double. It's it's tremendous. Now, during that same period, manufacturer employees have gone down twenty nine percent. Yep. So and and then when you really look at the output per person, um, that's gone up a hundred and sixty percent. So as you were saying, like let's say you know in nineteen eighty seven, your auto worker could make you know ten cars. Yep. Um. In 2017, they can make 26 cars. Yep. So right there is really going to... That's kind of... Yeah, which lowers the price of the cars, makes us more competitive with other producers overseas and so on. Mm -hmm. But it means that there are going to be fewer people employed in those jobs. Right. Now, I know a lot of people out there, um, especially like sometimes you talk about the automation, and it's... They'll look at uh, globalization, and they'll say the, it's usually like this automation versus globalization argument. And mm-hmm. I really think that that's kind of like a false. Like, oh yeah, argument. I cause, completely agree. Because I think it's really a, what's going on is a, it's a feedback loop. Yeah. Um, and and to kind of break this down, I mean, before you had globalization, I mean, I guess the antithesis would be mercantilism, mm-hmm. where you know instead of it's it's where trade is like a zero sum game, where yes. it's like if I'm I need to make sure that my exports are more than, you know, my imports. And I, actually, I want to make sure that I'm exporting as much as possible and then right. taxing things that come in and, and, and shutting that down uh, basically to kind of, you know, if, if we lose a trade, then other someone else is winning or vice versa. If we win and everyone else loses, and that's kind of right. the game there. Well, they found out that that really doesn't isn't ideal. Because it kind of overlooks the fact that if we're really good at something, we can tune our economy to produce that, uh, that something, X or whatever it is. We're really good at making X, uh, where another country is really good at making Y. And they can you can kind of tune their economic engine to do that. And um, if that's the case, then... You can have multiple players who are all profiting, all making money. Yeah. In fact, so, all right, I'm going to get a little wonky for a second. So everyone forgive me. Uh, So everybody knows of a gentleman named Adam Smith. Yes. And he described. nations. Yeah. Kind of a big deal. Right. So 1776, he writes his, you know, kind of a big year too. Uh, he writes. What happened that year? Yeah, not not much. No. <laughs> uh, he publishes uh, the Wealth of Nations. In there, uh, he describes you know the famous uh, invisible hand, but he also talks about a thing called absolute advantage, which is what Dennis was really referring to in that beginning, where it's um, if Dennis is good at making shoes and I'm good at building houses, he should make shoes for me. And I should help him build his house. Right. Well, there's right? also a good a good symbiotic example is I'm great at making hammers. Yeah. And you're great at building houses. Sure. I can't build a house worth a damn. Right. But, but you can make hammers. But I make hammers and you can't make hammers very well. Yeah. So if I, I can make money off you with the hammers and then you can make money using my hammers yeah. to build houses for other. And it just creates kind of like, you know, there's economic multipliers throughout yeah. all of that. So in uh, the, I think it's the 1830s, a gentleman by the name of David Ricardo came along and described what's called, um, instead of absolute advantage, it's called uh, comparative advantage, 
which a lot of, I mean, that is the root of uh, like more modern trade theory. There's a lot of things that went on to it, uh, like Nash equilibrium and all those types of things. But at the root, it's this comparative advantage idea, which is, okay, let's say Dennis is really good at making hammers and he's really good at making houses, right? Like mm-hmm. he's good at both and he's better at both than I am, right? But he's much better at making houses than I am, and he's only slightly better at making hammers than yeah. I am. So it would make more sense for us still to specialize. Yes, because I could, t- I could, I could profit more by concentrating fully on making houses and because getting that's the thing and getting were... slightly less good hammers from you. Yeah, and and so that is what uh, all of you know trade theory is based on this idea of comparative advantage. Right, but I guess I I, I go I want to we I went down this road a bit because I kind of wanted to eliminate this uh, thought. Humans in general tend to look for one reason. It's yeah. like X happened. I need to find out the one reason why. Yeah, and, and life really rarely ever really works that. No, way. you're right. It's a. In fact, a feedback loop is really a good way to describe it. Like, so what basically has happened with the the trade order that uh, has gone on? We'll say really from the 80s, but it, it started well before there, oh, yeah. since 1945, right, with the Marshall Plan and so on, but really since the 80s, um, maybe the 70s too, but what you saw is, okay, uh, the United States is a capital-rich country, mm-hmm. right? We have lots of land and uh, lots of money, right, lots of resources. We can throw at a problem, and we have lots of technology. However, countries that are coming up, right, in the world at the time in 1980, right, we had just squared things with uh, communist China. I think it was really in um, 1979. But anyways, the, uh, the point is they had lots of very, very cheap labor. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, you know, comparative advantage, right, they, ha- they could make – at the time, relatively, you know, in you know, non-complex items, uh, very, very cheaply by just throwing mountains of labor at it, right? And, you know, whereas we could make lots of things cheap, and you know, but we had to spend a lot of money on either capital or labor, right? Because of just the way our society is, so that went on for a long time. Fast forward to today, the wages of the average Chinese worker has increased like sixfold. Um, but so they're still, starting; it's, it's still, still much cheaper. Much cheaper but but they're yeah. they're starting to become much less cost competitive. Mm-hmm. So a lot of jobs are starting to either move away from China uh, to other parts of Southeast Asia or back towards Mexico, depending on or back to the United States, and so. Like you say, it's a constant, and and firms just do this on, on their own, right? It's a constant back and forth of is it cheaper for us to use our inputs of you know money and technology or you know cheap labor, right? right. And and that's kind of what happens is like when we outsource for the goods that require cheap labor, then we our economy puts that money into improving production in the things that we are going to specialize in. Right. Which is where the automation comes from. Well, and that's what... So when a job is lost to automation, right, a a type of job, for example, um, and automation in the way we're talking about it now is largely about, like, uh, more intelligent robotics or, uh, you know machines that can learn but right if you... and that's what it's been yeah i mean up until now because like we're and we'll get into this a little bit later of mm-hmm. like the next phase of automation with some ai and a lot yeah. of that's coming to sectors where you're not 
it's basically where people have migrated because there's 30 the 30 percent of people who moved away from the manufacturing sector yeah. went elsewhere but if you and, step back into the 80s and 90s there was plenty of types of jobs that were lost to automation oh yes from the early parts of the it revolution which it was like hey mail rooms mail rooms totally changed mm-hmm. used to employ a lot of people not now, now it's like a, maybe a couple yeah like one or two people in Executive course used to have bays of uh, receptionists, mm-hmm. right? There's just not a need for that yeah, well, that's, many. That's what it, yeah. A lot of it, like secretarial work in the '70s, it's now handled with software, right? Is and and it used to be one of the biggest jobs there were. Yeah, like, there were millions of people employed in that area, right? Um, and oddly enough, and and I'll get into this. A, I guess I guess I'll get into this a little bit later because it really kind of has to play. Um, kind of with the AI uh, topic we're going to get into on like probably the next evolution of automation. Because it's really only going to, I don't think worse is the right word. It's going to accelerate. But it's going, yes, it's going to accelerate. Um, yeah. And really, the, I guess this podcast is kind of, you know, if you are looking at a career <laughs> right now, uh, we're probably going to talk about ones you should probably steer clear steer of, steer clear of, or if you are towards. in it currently, maybe kind of hedge your bets and uh, yeah. maybe look at some uh, uh, other options. Yeah, um, because I can't see uh, uh, another ex- like because I mean, it's not just manufacturing. If you look at no. if you look at mining, I mean, the mining is another big one where um, coal mining specifically. Used to be, um, like well, in eighty seven, uh, same same numbers to uh, twenty seventeen, uh, output of coal mines is only down about sixteen point eight percent, which shocked me because with the you know with all the because the number of coal miners has gone down very very dramatically. Yeah, and that's what surprised me is like, but still the the fact that the, our coal output has only gone down you know sixteen point eight. I assumed it to be like a lot more because of all the investments in clean energy and and natural gas, and it, it, it's not. But what Joel is completely correct over that same period, jobs completely uh, plummet. It's down sixty seven percent over that time. So when my grandfather in coal mining, yeah, right? when my grandfather was a miner in West Virginia, you know, I've seen his gear right and seen pictures of him. And because by the time I knew him, he was an old man, right? Like, so he wasn't in the mines anymore. But uh, he had, like, a hat that had, like, I guess it's magnesium that would, you know, burn the... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? And a pick... hot. I, I presumably, right? <laughs> but a pickaxe and, like, you know, a lunch pail. And that was his gear, and now they're using very sophisticated heavy machinery. Oh yeah, right? well what they do is they well cuz like if you look at like the output similar to like you know how many like the car the guy who could or the person who could build, you know, 10 cars in yeah, in, in, exactly in 87 it can build, you know, 20 what I say it was, it was like 26 now. Um coal mining is a, it's the same thing uh, like the coal miner that could get a ton out of, you know, a mine can now get 2.6 tons out of a mine. But that's kind of like a almost kind of like a joke because it's not like you have the guy down there with a pickaxe anymore. Like you're no. saying, now they're like you know, it's somebody slicing the top off of a mountain right. <laughs> and sucking the coal out. Yeah, they're out heavy of the machine operators. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, so that um, I mean, and it's it's kind of this way across all. You know, I would say you're more blue collar. Yeah, the uh, sectors. The jobs that I would argue, and and this is probably really useful, right? Like to think about like uh, different sectors, right? Like you're saying, and go, okay, what kind of technology set is gonna displace those jobs? Right. So, any type of job that is dangerous and highly manual, right? Uh, relatively dangerous, right? Like because it's all relative. Um, in highly manual, I would say would be the first ones that would have to worry about robotic automation. Right. And it's got to be a task that can be, that isn't, that doesn't. It's got to be repeatable. Yes. It doesn't, it it doesn't take a lot. I mean, it might take a lot of brute force or strength, but it doesn't take a lot of, you know, discernible, um, steps where you have to make a choice. 
Yeah. In fact, you can even look at, so I'll give you three examples, right? Um, well, let's stick with the two for right now. So the, the first one is uh, long haul trucking. Well, actually that, I was I, I was going to get into that because okay. that is the it's funny you should mention that because that that is the job yeah. where all of these people have migrated to. Yeah. If you look right now, and I think that's one of the most at risk jobs. I know, and that's and I, I was going to like right now, out of if all fifty states, twenty nine out of the fifty states, the most common job is long haul. Yeah, I believe there's like four or five million long haul truckers in this country. It's it's it, well, it's I mean, I'm sorry, gigantic. it's not it's not just long haul, it's delivery too. Well, yeah, because like my brother in law is a is a trucker and he does. I think his routes are no longer than three hours, right? Like, so that's like low. I forget what they call that, but that's like a local distribution trucking. But they're also long haul, where it's from I don't know Jersey City to Long Beach, right? And like that's a that's a big big drive, right? Yeah, I, and and it's kind of been over time. It just seems like that's because and it's completely survived the automation. Two yeah. reasons, okay, because the things that kill jobs and we, we, that we just mentioned are globaliza- like globalization and automation. Yeah, and you can't, you can't outsource trucking. Exactly. Right? Like you can't go, like a, you can't sit there Someone and say a guy in, in China is going to drive the truck, right. you know, to, you know, You can Ohio have other from people from Maryland. that country come here, right. but they have to be here because it is geographically right. based. And the automation doesn't work yet yeah but i will tell you like i'll give you a really good example have you seen the movie logan yet i have not yet okay it's on the list this is not a spoiler i'm a big comic nerd too so i'm really upset that i haven't seen that one it's it's very good the problem is is it was rated r and usually like i'll take my daughter to go see you know yeah. comic book movies but like she, it she was, was pretty intense oh i can imagine and i because I, I saw like deadpool was insane and i, I wasn't about to take i would to see say deadpool. this is far gorier than, than deadpool? deadpool yeah whoa because deadpool really didn't like i mean it's kind of comic-y like yeah, that's violence it's... but it's still pretty violent All right, but i digress okay here's where i was going there is a scene and we're watching it my wife and i and uh you know like wolverine logan is right. uh like driving and there are these trucks going by and I saw it and something registered funny and, and didn't see it. Like it didn't click. So I was like, rewind that. I said, look at those trucks. There's no cab. None at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because if you were to design a, a, uh, a car, Right or in this case a truck. Yeah, you'd want more. Right? Why, why would waste you want a cargo cab space? Yeah. If you, yeah, and they were actually hooking together and driving as a train sometimes. Well, right? yeah, that's that's the beauty of like the automated car is yeah. they'll be able to move with such precision yeah. that you'll have like a, I've, I read a study that thirty percent of urban traffic could be reduced by just moving to automated cars without building any extra roads. Right, yeah, because they would all just kind of run in a train down yeah. the line, and then one and would move out, and they would just and, yeah, yeah. go into the exit ramp. But So I, I really do believe, like, long-haul trucking is uh, one of the first and most vulnerable industries. Um, which is scary. Because there's so many people Because that that's the job that where people went. Yeah. Like, that's where any... All, that's Because it's, uh, first off, it's... The pay is comparable to working in the yeah. manufacturing sector. Yeah, you can make a decent living. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, relatively, I mean, it's a skilled job. Yeah, driving is a skill. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, it, it's, a, it's a good job where you can feel good about yourself and you can make a decent living doing it to support a family, mm-hmm. um, which there are less and less of, quote unquote, your blue collar type jobs yeah. out there that are up for grabs. Um, I really can't. I'm, I'm kind of hard pressed to think of many outside of, of like your welding and your right, yeah, yeah your construction type jobs. And and honestly, if you look at how I think, and I'm just speculating here, right? Like, obviously, right? Uh, but how I think it, it's going to go down is that you're going to end up with, uh, at least for a while, uh, a trucking lane, which they do have on some highways. 
right? And that trucking lane will be uh, specialized for automated trucking for a while, right? Like there will be, you know, n- you know, driverless trucks right. that will use those lanes exclusively. Um, and they'll be used to take, you know, things from whatever uh, distribution hub they came, let's say the Port of Baltimore, right, to, I don't know, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, mm-hmm. right? And you'll just drive down, what's that, 81, and then, you know, across. And you could drive them all night. And frankly, all you need to do, right, is what we'll probably still have is a human that rides in them, right, like for a while, that at the end handles all of the paperwork and things like that and takes over because people are going to be rightly a little anxious about like the first few generations of oh, yeah, yeah. automated trucks. Well, yeah, you want, they right? probably want a human there just in case something, something goes, goes wrong weird. and a, and a, you know, a decision would need to yeah, be made. But they'll largely be able to sleep in the truck. So it'll be much safer, but you also won't need as many truckers, right? Because they can largely sleep. They can largely relax. Like, um, while they're doing it because they're they're on autopilot. Yeah. It's just like it's like a plane and a pilot in the plane, right? And like, honestly, I know if I'm running a company like that, I'm going to be able to outsource other jobs. I'm going to be able to get rid of other jobs because the person who's riding yeah. in the truck is going to be do- doing other stuff for my company. Yeah. That, that, that's what how a CEO is going to think. They're yeah. not going to – they don't Absolutely. want some guy just hanging out eight hours a day in a truck. They're going to want them doing some other kind of work. So at some – that's going to eliminate more jobs. Well, and the other thing is that since now, right, like driving, especially a long haul, is very taxing on the brain, right? Like you right. get exhausted. Yes. Right? So they, for safety reasons, cap the number of hours you can drive. I think it's like eight or something like that. So you drive that length. Now, one, that length can be extended. Two, um, you could drive, like, let's say you're eight hours, turn around and drive the same truck with a different load right back. Right. Right? Like, and you just ping them back and forth, right? Like, that, just by being able to extend the length of time that a person will be productive in that truck, it will reduce the number of truckers you need. Yeah. They're thinking that, you know... We're talking because, like we, as we said, you know, trucking is a major. It's a big industry, major industry with lots of people working in it. So we're not talking about this like it's you know going to happen when we're kind of you know raising Old grandkids, and gray, yeah. right? <laughs> no, um, I just today I, I saw it was a report, a uh, study done um, from uh, it was a combined effort between Oxford and Yale universities. Um, and they're pegging truck driving to be taken over fully, like by machines to work. Like, and when I say full, fully, it is in industry, like yeah. not, you know, it, it, industry saying, okay, well, we're not going to be using humans to drive trucks anymore. It's 2026. Yeah. So that's nine, nine years from now. So this goes to the one that I was telling you about when we first got here. So if you were going to. So there's the world's oldest profession. And we won't talk about the automation of that, right? That's, well, hmm. You know, not, a, not right now. Now you got me right? thinking. Like, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, there's, <laughs> but there's the world's second oldest, uh, you know, vocation, which is... Uh, Motherhood? No. Is <laughs> violence, right? Is, is war. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, the Army, the U.S. Army, its strategy is that by 2025, so eight years, mm-hmm. uh, there will be so many – there will be as many robots in combat as we have uh, humans, right? And they will be running squads that have humans and robots integrated with we each other. We are so close to Terminator. It's, like, I mean, 2025, <laughs> like I could throw a rock at 2025. That is really close, right? Like I'm not convinced that my children will ever take a driving test. 
I don't. Yeah, I'm kind of that that way too because I maybe no, your oldest because she's not that far away. The way I see it, when I look at the data on driving and automation. It just makes too much sense for it not to happen. Yeah. The only thing holding it up is kind of human stubbornness, I yeah. think. Um, because first off, it's it's the biggest killer there is, like when yeah. it comes to human life. Well, not to be driving is- a car. Every if you look at like the ten most dangerous occupations, they all have to trucking do, is very yeah, high up in the list. They all have to do with driving something. It's yeah. like uh, uh, the funny thing is, is Police officers, and most people think that, you know, police officers... I think I mean, they're, like, number 11 or 12. It, it's up there, because... Yeah. And it's not because of them... Like, while they do, like... I mean, when an officer is killed in the line of duty, um, like, from a, you know, say, a gunshot or, or something like that, then it makes, you know, that makes a headline. So that's what you think normally, because you right. always hear when that happens. But it's often car accidents. But that's what it is. Whatever, it's, like, yeah. the majority of, yeah. you know, law in the line of duty casualties for police officers is when they're driving their car. Yeah. Because they get sleepy just like the rest of yeah. us, right? Like, yeah, and it's not high-speed chases. It's no. just accidents. If uh, you if you drive around enough, you will right. get in an accident. And I... I like driving as much as the next fellow, right? Like, you know, we're we're Americans. We like our cars. Well, yeah. Right? I mean, the the car is just. I mean, yeah. it's like apple pie. And it's cowboys. quintessentially it's like, American, right? Right. So this is a big cultural shift, and and that's why I think. I mean, if you look at trucking, it's ripe for it. It is a dangerous profession. It is not like something people do for fun. It's a it's a job, right? It's a vocation. So, and the companies that run that, they care about their margin. They don't care that, you know, it, it's not recreational, right? Like you and me driving to the store or driving to the park or driving wherever, like that's recreational. That's our own thing. Mm-hmm. And that being automated, that's another societal shift that I think this first one well, this was, with yeah. trucking is is an easy sell to those companies. Well, you know, not only that, it's like you will start to see those changes uh, happen uh, where money is to be made. Yeah. Right. This is really what it comes down to. And, you know, sh- you're probably going to see, I think, tr- probably the trucking industry is the first place it's really going to see that and maybe yeah. like, um, you know, your uh, delivery services. Yeah. And, um, you know, bus lines and, 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 sure. you know, things like that. Um, that's where you'll see automation come into play in a big way. Um, and we're going to have to think of a solution for that when it comes to the economy. And, yeah people working yeah in in so when you were talking earlier about um the ramifications of uh the industrial revolution and people moving into the factories and children moving in the factories and then labor laws having to be established right, right? safety regulations yeah it was so a on. cultural whirlwind i mean yeah. the whole world like, all of these changed. things need to be rethought right right I think we're getting ready to go through the same. Sort I'm of seeing thing. that too, and I th- it's going to come down on the side of e- economics and 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 yeah. and not being able to. I th- while while there will always be work to do, yeah. There's it might not be the work that everyone wants to do. Well, there there might not be. We it is conceivable that we could get to a world where. Full-time work for everyone is not necessary to provide for our needs and even basic wants. Yeah, well, that was the original goal. That's the funny part is the original goal when selling people kind of on um, workplace automation yeah. was the, – the, and I'm not talking about like the goal of the – you know. Owners of the companies. Yeah. I'm talking about the goals of how people pitched it. The goals of the inventors of the technology kind of looked at it as, hey, we can like, you know, we can automate this stuff. 
you know, people won't have to go into mines and they won't have to work 10 hour days in yeah. a dusty, dirty factory getting black lung. They, they can, you know, we'll be able to put this automation in place and everyone's lives will improve because they won't have mm. to do these horrible jobs anymore. Absolutely. Like they use, and, uh, for example, they use uh, bomb sniffing robots now. Right. Right. Like, uh, well, I far prefer that over a person with a dog. Yes. Right? Like, I, ju- I just far prefer that. And and I'm sure the people who disarm bombs far prefer yeah, that. Yeah, I think any human being with any type of soul would probably <laughs> right. so agree. You, you, look at the, you look at a lot of jobs in society, and I mean, you add them all up. It's a huge amount that are relatively dangerous. And, uh, you know, it... it we're getting to the point where they can be automated away. Not entirely, but they can at least partly be automated away. Right. Right? And so you end up with people having to come up with policy solutions for... So up until this point, uh, meaning in time, like um, job creation, right? Like, all right, so take the automobile. Right. Mm -hmm. When the automobile caught on, uh, everybody who made saddles was out of business. Right. Except for the very niche. Yeah. Yeah, Very niche. You know, hey, we make saddles for the, you know, instead of every person in the country. Right. right? We make it for, you know, the hundred thousand. Yeah. And I'm sure at the time it was like, you know, generally you could go into a store and get like a $10 saddle. Yeah. Like, and now it's like, you can only buy a $150 saddle. Right. Or whatever. Right. (laughs) Because they they needed to like high, like specialize them. And, but if you were buying a wagon wheel, uh, company stock, right? Like you felt really bad when the car came out. But when that happened, when that shift happened, we ended up in a place where enough jobs were created in the factories to offset all of those other jobs right, right. that were destroyed. Yeah. We're getting to the point where I am certain that there will be many, many, many new jobs that are created, right? Yeah. Well, But will there be enough new jobs to offset the number of jobs that are displaced and will they be for the same type of people i'll tell you another thing to that's going to compound that issue um back during the industrial revolution and that shift while um the workforce was much more i mean even though they didn't have the ability to move like we do now they're a much more mobile workforce yeah. it wasn't a Far big deal few people owned land well not only that homes. but they weren't like today it seems that and a lot of this has to do with policies that we put in place in this country mm-hmm. but a lot of people are tied to their job because of health care or yeah. because they're tied they're tied to a mortgage or a house that they cannot sell and then it just wasn't it wasn't like that it was like men the people didn't own yeah, they their just picked up and left yes they would just and like the way you didn't have to worry about your health care plan then because nobody had health care. Well, well, I mean, you right. know, I mean, doctors were a fairly new thing at the turn right. of the century. <laughs> I mean, oh, it, man. It, it, I've it, read I've read books right, used to about get, the healthcare industry used to, and <laughs> used to go to the oh. barber <laughs> to, get, yeah. to have a surgeon work on. Yeah, you. <laughs> exactly. He knows how to use a knife. He's been shaving my beard right. for. If oh. you don't know, a little aside, that's what like the red and white pole means. Yeah. Did you know that? That like did uh, both. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, it had something to do with like i think if it was if it was red they had they did the if it had red in it then they would do like surge or blood like bloodletting i think it was and then if they had like there was like ornamentation that would go on the top that would also like let them know other things like other types of surgery that they were performing but that barber pole originally would basically let people because no one could read at the time i mean that was kind of like back in the day when like not everyone was literate so right. they would have like a method of discerning like what operations can i get oh that barber does leeches and bloodletting so i'm gonna yeah, go back just, to that one. Oh boy. <laughs> so but but so think about all of those things right like are we going to create jobs fast enough during this time period to take care of all these people and we're gonna have to get really serious about things 
you know, policy decisions that we as a country are not, I don't think, really ready to make decisions on. Well, I don't like, know if we're, we're ready. I know our, our current political system is just not capable of, it doesn't of, seem like of quick it. innovation and change. Yeah, so things like, well, I'll start with the smaller ones and then get to the bigger ones. But like uh, portability of health insurance. That's a huge. That, that is would a, help a lot. That's a huge killer because you can't. It's so hard to just say, yeah. say you're, it, 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 people can get stuck in a job because yeah. of their health care plan. Well, and they get stuck in the job. And what ends up happening is they stay so long in that one job uh, that they can't re, you know, sharpen their skills yep. to adapt to the changing environment. Yes. And that's a problem. Yeah, so you got that. That's one. Then another one that is a fairly big deal is massive retraining programs. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem with retraining programs is adults tend to not retrain very well. The Like, the success rate data on retraining programs is not that favorable. But you got to do something. Yeah. Right. Like, so even if it has a moderate success rate, it still gets some people back productive in the labor force. And then I think the third is like, you know, Internet access. Well, yeah, that's a good one. Because, I mean, really, that wasn't my third, but that's a good one. Well, I mean, that's kind of because and I kind of look at this. It's it's like training programs don't do well. And I think a lot of that has to do with kind of corralling people and sending them to a class is kind of it's almost kind of like a lot of training programs it's almost they're there because they've been mandated to go there for some reason well and like in order to get this government subsidy or this government program you need to go to to this thing blah blah blah. um and and i think maybe that has a lot to do with why the success rate not and i'm not saying everybody who goes to job training programs um are, are like that but if you have a number of people that are in those situations going to them, it's going to skew the numbers and sure. probably hurt the success rate of the program. Well, and, and the beauty of... But with the internet, yeah, it, it then would. you can kind of do what you can train yourself. Well, and you can also, let's say from a policy perspective, with internet-based programs, right, uh, they are best-case scenario for flexibility for the trainee. Right. right. You don't have to drive somewhere. You can yeah. have the class with a bunch of other people, too. Again, we're talking about people that are probably going to be of the age where they have children. Mm-hmm. They have other responsibilities. Right. Right. So they need flexibility. So that's a huge plus. And then the other uh, big advantage I see to it is it's extremely scalable. Right. Because if you're doing something like a CBT, computer based training, right, mm-hmm. and you're building that as a way to support people. Uh, look at like the Khan Academy. There are hundreds of millions of people that have taken courses on the Khan Academy, which if you don't know, it's a um, computer-based training program that is, I think, almost exclusively on YouTube. Yeah, I don't know if it, I'm not, I think it's predominantly YouTube, is it? at least. But, but there's other ones too. Like there's great courses. Well, Plus, and you just and... take all of those. Right, like there's just hundreds of millions of people who have watched these videos and learned various things. So, so scalability from computer-based training is a huge benefit. Right, and then you know it, they're also cheap. Right, like you record them once, you show them a hundred thousand times. Right, right, and even if even if you want to, even if you don't want to do it on a recorded basis, like you can still have. Oh, yeah, you could do them live, live yeah, stream. You, yeah, you could have like a you know a live professor do I mean like connect like a couple hundred people and yeah, teach absolutely. a class over, and it, it'll be cheaper because oh, yeah. you don't need to do it in the building. People well, don't have to go in, there. It's geographically neutral. Exactly. Right? Like that's the other big advantage is that like if and you can have trying, more people. You yeah, know, attend that course. So so that's a good third one. And I think the big fourth one that is it's kind of the nuclear option for for the hey, if we're not creating jobs as fast as we're uh seeing them destroyed by automation, then we need to start talking seriously about a basic income, which is like a guaranteed right. income level for everyone yeah now, that it, is a political it, oh, hotbed it is. right now but you know what though i mean i think it is just because it's kind of looked at as 
a handout. But if you, a lot of people have less problems with the earned income credit. So yeah. I don't see why we wouldn't be able to take a lot of our existing programs, especially ones that kind of have and a tweak them, yeah, have a kind of negative connotation associated with them, yeah, and just kind of tweak them, yeah, to make them more, you know, politically appealing to the. There's masses. also lots of like libertarians that advocate for something like this, where you go, hey, so I say that so that. Everyone realizes it's not just us lefty nuts right. that say basic income. Like libertarians have been talking about for years the idea of, hey, don't shove everybody in, you know, various welfare programs. Give them a chunk of money. Right. And let them go get whatever services they want out of the market. Yeah, and, and that line of thinking, though, that's kind of even baked into our tax code. Yeah. Um, because um, if you look at sales tax, certain things aren't taxed because we're, they're looked at as something for survival, like yeah. food and, you know, medicine and things like that. So the ideal of, you know, having enough money to survive... <laughs> Is kind of, you know, seems, at least from my point of view, I think most people kind of agree. Well, here's the other big thing. And this is a straight economic opinion, right? Like economists will tell you, or not all of them, but some, this is kind of prevailing wisdom, which is, so what drives economic growth largely in, in any modern economy is consumption. Yeah, of course. And if all, meaning like people buying goods and services. So if all of a sudden you have a very large portion of your population whose income that's generated from their own earning power drops to zero, your consumption growth is going to be very seriously affected. Right. Well, yeah, right? anytime you want to stimulate the economy... Honestly, give money. Put to, money. Give money to poor people. Yeah, because they'll spend it, and that well, they will, have to, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like the one, the, it is normally said, like, oh, they'll spend it, but I mean, like, the the luxury of being an affluent person is by definition that your necessities are taken care of already, right? right? Like, right. There's you a already reason, have enough food. There's a reason that. you have money, and it's right. because you're able to put money somewhere to you can have it later. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like, of course poor people spend the money. They are poor, right? Like, it's by definition they have to spend the money right. to just make it by, right? Like, and so... um. Anyways, I, I'm not saying basic income is the answer. No, but I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying there's probably a way where we can do it to where there's some ins. Because I think the biggest problem that people, when they kind of like get their hair up about you know things like basic income and welfare, different various welfare programs or whatever, it, it's because they feel like it's a, a it takes the incentive out of yeah. working or yeah, contributing. Which, I mean, I get it. It's a legitimate concern. So there's probably ways where we could still implement them programs yep. and still have an incentive, like it's and have those. Well, one of the theories I've heard is that you provide a basic income not just to people who are out of work; you provide it to everyone, right? And so then the incentive is if you want more than that, right, you go work, and that works from a scientific standpoint because humans are relative beings, yeah. And like while I know because people. I'll hear people say, like, being poor in America is better than being poor anywhere else. But because of the human condition, you only compare yourself to yeah. other people that you see compare around you. Peers, right? yeah, so yeah. that's not necessarily true. Like, if there's right. less disparity in a poor country, those people, I mean, the data the kind of, like, you know, proves this. Yeah. Uh, if, there's, if there's less disparity, but, like, people are generally more poor in a country... Yeah. Those people will be happier than in a country where they're much richer on average, but yep. there is much more disparity. Yeah. Uh, because the people who are on the lower yeah. rung are sadder because they're, they're more. There's more separation between them and their other human beings. Well, the, I them. mean, so television has done a lot of this, where like you can see what you've got to keep up with with the Joneses, right? Right, like you didn't know what 
So the example that I've always heard growing up was like, and and some of this is rose colored glasses, I'm sure, but uh, like my mom and uh, some of my aunts, I've talked to them and they've basically said they had no idea that they didn't have any money, right? Like, because everybody lived exactly the same in their mm-hmm. little, you know, uh, town in West Virginia. And, you know, they had no running water for a long time, uh, no electricity, all of these things. And it's like, you know, that's pretty bad in the, you know, 50s in the United States, mm-hmm. right? That's kind of a rough uh, road. But, um, you know, if everybody else around you is in the same boat, you don't think much of it, right? right? And so I, I would, when I bring up things like basic income or any of these other uh, points. All I'm really saying with automation is automation, especially this uh, iteration of automation, right? Where we're getting into the physical world. We're outside of just software, right? We're talking about doing things in the physical world, mm-hmm. like trucking or uh, going on armed guard with the army, right? Like those types of things. Like, there's going to these debates about these types of topics are going to be forced. We are going to have to deal with yeah, these at some issues, point because right? you're just going to have a lot of people at work. And I mean, so far we've just been talking about like you know your more blue collar oriented jobs, but that's that is that's tip of the iceberg. That yeah, because there's so a lot of us think we're in safe industries and we're not. No, and and a big win, a big win is the healthcare industry mm-hmm. because that's. The place where you look at where a lot of your a bulk of your white collar jobs are yeah. in the healthcare industry right now. Yeah. And there is a ton of AI right now, and a lot of it has to do with Watson is a big part. Predi- any predictive analytics and things like that where you can you can basically feed an out al- you can create an algorithm, feed it a bunch of data, and have it start to see patterns in the data. Because medical records are just they're like that there's only so many things that would usually go wrong with the human body and if you can sit there and just have a computer just start to mix and match and kind of just put data in piles and say this stuff looks alike and that stuff looks alike before you know it it'll be able to sit there and do a much better job at deciding what's wrong with someone than the doctor can well in in what they've shown so far in studies is uh particularly with watson which is ibm's artificial intelligence platform um and they are focusing very heavily in healthcare and by the way healthcare makes up 16 percent, so that's like one eighth of our entire economy yep right so um so our healthcare industry is bigger than most other entire economies on the planet, right? So uh, what they found is is the most effective is you take Watson or AAI um, and you have it look at all of the records and the current scans and so on, and it starts putting up probabilities of likely, you know, diagnoses. Right. And then what happens is the human, you know, doctor with all of their specialized skills and years of training and, you know, seeing odd anomalies, right, goes, oh, you know what? It's that one. It's not the first one. It's the second one. Yes, but then you feed that decision point back into the algorithm. So if you do that enough, then – and that's how you train the AI. Yeah. Because at that course. point, like, it's – the system – the doctor's knowledge actually goes back into the system. Yeah. It gets captured, and so the AI gets Smarter. more intelligent right. over time. And, and these aren't, like, down-the-road things. This is stuff that's happening no, right that's now. that's current. There's, like, a whole list of – here, I, I mean, I pulled this up from an article in um, – phys, it's, like, physics.org. Where yeah. they, they did a whole like healthcare article. I'll put it in the show notes on um, health yeah. IT. Um, so here's some examples. Okay, California researchers detected uh, cardiac arrhythmia with 97% accuracy on wearers of an Apple Watch uh, with the AI based cardiogram application. Um, and that opened up early treatment options to avert strokes. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, another one is a uh, scientist in Harvard and the University of Vermont developed machine learning tool, a uh, type of AI that enables computers to learn without being explicitly programmed uh, to better identify depression by studying Instagram posts. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So they, and really it was just like, now they, they're looking at social media as a new avenue for early screening of uh, detecting mental illness. Sure. Um, you know, r- researchers from uh, Britain's University of of Nottingham created an algorithm that predicted heart attacks better than doctors using conventional guidelines. So they invented an AI that can diagnose heart attacks better than doctors can. So um, here's here's the real reason, or, or the biggest reason behind this, right, is um, take a, uh, a human doctor. Let's say they can see 10 patients a day. And let's say they're specialized, so they're seeing it more or less the same, you know, subsector of uh, the healthcare industry, right? Like, so they're heart doctors, and so they're looking at that over and over and over again. So 10 a day, 220 days, which is like average uh, uh, work year, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they end up seeing 2,200 a year, and they do that over, you know, Let's say thirty years, so you're up to what sixty six thousand or something like that over the course of a career. Yeah, something like that. Uh, an algorithm can sit down and, with enough computing power, do that in an evening. Yeah, and that's right? the thing. It'll Look s- at that many samples in an evening. Right. And that's the difference, is that the AI can look at so much more data than a human could ever look at. Yeah, because I. I- I don't have the I don't have the study in front of me, but they were saying like the average like OBGYN spends like you know four hours going through a chart to make a diagnosis, yeah, or to you know you, you know to make a you know decision on a healthcare outcome, uh, where you know an AI can do it in a matter of minutes, sometimes mm-hmm. less, and so. All right, we've kind of bummed everybody out about the AI stuff. So well, it's not It's not really... Me, I mean, my intent isn't to bum out. It's really to kind of prepare. Well, and my, my point is, let's talk about, like, some of the positives with this for really quick. Well, I mean, there's tons... And, and you're right. We haven't really concentrated on the positives, because there are positives with the other things we were talking about, too. Well, yeah, so in, let's backpedal for a sec. Okay. Like, look at... Take trucking. Right, like the idea of letting machines do that, especially if they have dedicated less lanes, people dying on the road, a lot less people dying on the road. Right, right. Go to doctors, much better health, uh, health uh, care options or uh, outcomes. Not only that, right. but we have more health care to go around at that point. Well, because the big health care problem we have right now is we it's don't a limited have resource. Right, and and on top of that, right, all of us go in. I I happen to really like my. Uh, Current general practitioner, Doctor C three PO. Yeah, exactly. No. Uh, R two D two. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so, but you know, one of the the big knocks on doctors for ever has been like, oh, they just kind of mill you through, right? Like they, you go in, no, you yeah, sit they down, have to see like eighty patients. They have to see eighty patients. But now, if the AI is is uh, reducing all of the time they need to do to scan the charts and right. blah blah blah, like. They can spend more time with patients, which is what humans are better at doing. Right. Especially with something like healthcare, you never want to remove the human interaction. No, you don't like you don't want C3PO going in. It's like, you are going to die, sir. Right. Have a nice day. Right. <laughs> like walking. Out. Yeah, you don't want that. You want a human there to talk to you and be like, you're gonna die, sir. Right? Like have a nice day. Have a nice day. <laughs> Right, but but so yeah, uh, like there's there's tons of upside to all this, like coal mining, right? Like being able to go into the mines safer, less right. humans, you know, injured or less or canaries dying. Less canaries are a big deal in the mines. Uh, yeah, but it's exactly that. So there's tons and tons of upside, right? But as Dennis has been pointing out, there's Things that all of us as people that make our livings doing whatever it is we do, we need to be conscious of because this change is a common. Right. And I kind of look at it more of a kind of 
we're not you're not going to stop this no it's and because even like 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 globalization, you're not going to stop globalization. You right. could sit there and say we're going to put tariffs on country on China, whatever. Right. You know. You know what's going to happen? Those companies who need to outsource are going to go to the next in line. Yeah, they go to Vietnam. Yeah. So yeah. So Mexico unless you decide that you're going to go with an all out global trade war and just ta- tariff everybody, complete protectionism, then it's not going to work. Which even if you do that, what ends up happening is. Um, you stifle economic growth in your country. Yes, but that's like a whole separate Because debate. everybody else is playing a more efficient game. Because yeah. a long time ago, we learned that mercantilism really doesn't work, no. that it's free trade, as bad as the connotation is out there, is actually better economically for the country as a whole. Yeah. So every other country in the world that's playing the free trade game is going to cuz they're going to have the benefit of having of using their economic engines have lower prices to, to augment one yeah, another exactly. where we are just going to have our own and granted America's we economic have a huge engine, engine is right, so yeah. amazing yeah. that it could probably compete for a while but eventually would lose ground to the rest of the entire world kind of working yeah. together in a free trade model well and then automation is that conundrum locally on steroids right, right. like yeah because it is yeah it's local right like there's just not much debate right like how can in our country in particular right once that their innovation genie's out of the box yeah you can't put in it our country in particular right like the government doesn't tell firms what's what very often right right it doesn't tell business owners uh, what's what very often. And it's it's normally pretty narrow in those definitions. Like when you go look at um, uh, like Soviet Russia back in the day, mm-hmm. um, they actually had, uh, I forget the kind of curve you use in economics, but basically they had this model where they would set the units of production, right? Like so they'd say, we need a thousand tires off this line, mm-hmm. and I don't care if we throw a thousand people making one tire, you know, a day at it, or we have a machine that makes a uh, thousand, you know, in a day, whatever, right? Like that. That in principle was how it's supposed to work, but uh, the whole government was set up as an employment program. Right. They had to keep everyone working. Yeah. That, so that, they the, always deferred to the one person, one tire type model. Yeah. Right? Because their policy said everyone has to work. Everyone has to work. Right. Whereas here, it's not that way. Right. right? And so firms are free to, you know, take whatever innovation is out there that will benefit their bottom line or you know if they have some sort of moral bent to them where they think it's great to run a jobs program they they're free to do that too but that just firms that do that are likely to lose in the market right so i i don't see any way you can even slow it down no and i think that like as we said like slowing it down isn't the answer we need to adapt yeah and i think that's the only way to go while the short-term ad- adaptation, I can't see, you know, things like basic income and things like that coming into play in America. No. I just not, don't think... Not right now. I just don't think it's feasible. Even or even talking about extending earned income credit is a touchy subject in current political climates. So one thing I think we can do, though, is internet access. And because we've talked about this before, there is a correlation between how well a locality's economy is and how much bandwidth their internet delivers on average. Right, and it is it is hard to tell which is the chicken there and which is the egg, but I'm pretty right. comfortable with saying that um, business model innovation is enabled by internet connectivity. Yeah, right. well, you also it gives you the ability to be a home entrepreneur. Oh, and that's what I mean. Right. It's like you can do many, many different things to generate income with an internet connection. Right. And it takes a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of know-how, yeah. but the beauty of the internet connection is you can get that you know-how, get know-how from the internet connection. Exactly. You can also like let's say you didn't want to generate income 
from your internet connection. You can get the know-how based on what we were talking about earlier with like the CBTs and so on mm -hmm. to go become an accountant or, you know, a registered nurse or whatever. Right. right. And like I was, I was talking about earlier about that article where um, they gave you like the most, um, uh, what, what's the most common job in that given state? Yeah. Now, like, and it was like 29 out of 50 states are, you know, truck drivers. Now, the like, majority of those states are in the middle of the country. Right. Uh, I mean, there is some, you know, in the, you know, southern eastern seaboard truck drivers. You're looking at like Georgia, South Carolina, North right. Carolina. They're all truck drivers. But above that, it's, you know, various jobs like, you know, teachers or primary jobs in some, like nursing aid, things like that. Um, if you go, like, California's truck drivers as well. That's like yeah. the biggest job there too. Um, but in, bulk of those truck driving jobs are also like in the middle of the country with the exception of our friends in Utah. Yay, Utah. We talk about Utah a lot in the podcast because yeah. it's like internet Shangri-La. Like they, <laughs> Especially Provo. Right, because they know. have they have yeah. really, really fast internet in their urban hubs out there. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they decide to lay down they, they tried they they tried and failed at municipal internet. Yeah. But the beauty of failing at municipal internet is they were able to use the infrastructure they put down to bring in companies and basically say on the cheap yeah hey yeah. if you install like if you come to our area and install like you know your fiber we have all this copper lying around that yeah. we'll just sell it to you all you have to do is like cover the debt that we've created because our municipal internet right. failed and and that deal worked out and now they have like internet like bandwidth out the wazoo over in utah and yeah. because of that software developer is, is their an, number one their number one job in yeah. utah colorado too because and because colorado is, is also self well, software developer I and that's because it's because of the pot uh, yes probably i think it's that um yeah. you know medicine. and the lots of microbrews right because right. you know, no, actually, I think it's because they're they're very good about um, municipal internet over in Co Colorado. They do a good job there. So, all right, well, we'll agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, while this episode has definitely deviated from the usual fare, yeah, um, if, if we've kind of circled it back, and you know, we may or may not had some Machiavellian plan to bring it back to this. But it really comes down to, I think, the first step we can do to help the future here is to invest in affordable internet access. Yep. The internet across shall the set country. us free. Because that's the one thing we can do, I think, right now that's a politically feasible solution. Yeah. Or at least not a, not a full solution, but at least something that will give people a leg up to Everybody's kind of weather this automation yeah. uh, storm. I guess, uh, that's coming or and that we're in the middle of. Everybody is comfortable right now with infrastructure spending, right? So if we can get even a small fraction of that, uh, you know, huge uh, amount of money that is planned for roads and bridges and so on to um, be routed towards uh, various internet programs, uh, life will be a lot better for a lot of communities. And and they will probably be able to weather the storm a lot better. Right. So moral of the story here of this episode, Ajit, step up, man. Get that yeah. affordable broadband out there. Something. <laughs> so, okay. So I guess that brings this episode to a close. Now, I... I did want everyone's opinion out there. While we did tie it to the theme of the Grounded Reason podcast of affordable internet access to everyone, um, this episode has been a bit of a diversion from what we've done in the past. And, you know, let us know if you like it, you know, if you want more like yeah. this. Maybe we I mean, do one of these every now and again. Yeah, where we kind of just uh, take a topic that is technology adjacent or, you know, something outside of cord cutting or internet access and kind of just have a discussion. Um, you know, let us know what you think. You can send us an email at uh, podcast at groundedreason.com. You can follow us on Twitter. The handle is at groundedreason. 
you know, uh, leave your feedback on our Facebook page. You know, I'll put all those links in the show notes. If you are enjoying the show, uh, please subscribe. It's the way, especially in iTunes, because that's how um, when you subscribe to our podcast, then we go up in the rankings within our category, which yeah. I think is tech news. Um, and then more people will see the show and we will be, you know, our listenership will grow, which means Joel we'll and I will be doing this. more inclined to do this every week. Unless you want us to like not do this anymore. Then I, I want to ask you why are you listening to our podcast? <laughs> that, that's devious. That's, yeah, it's really weird. That, so, that's fantastic. You know. <laughs> so uh, you could also leave us a review unless you're one of those people that want to see us fail who listen every week. Um, you, go ahead and just, you know, you could leave us a review on iTunes. That also gives our show some visibility. Yeah, and if you want to hear Joel and I uh, cover a topic, you know, just send it to us. And, you know, if it's... Uh, if it sounds fun, we'll do it. So yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, we'll even give you a we'll give you a mention. Say yeah. that you know so and so suggested this, and this episode has been viewer request or <laughs> listener request. Yeah, maybe we could do like a bonus that week. Yeah. yeah. So thanks everybody for listening out there. This is Dennis Rostaro, and this is Joel Reeves. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. You know. I'm going to get a robot to automate your take care. That's not cool. I'm going to put you out of a job. I don't get paid for this. Well, no, not the whole podcast, just the take care part. I definitely don't get paid for that. Yeah, but I'm just going to automate that out. Fine. (laughs)